So this is the first time I'm in a meditation hall in 20 years. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I left the monastery 20 years ago. And uh, so just prior to the nine years with Ruth Dennison and uh, the six years with Ajahn Sumedho as a meditation monk, I had also spent 17 years exploring meditation techniques on my own. So I became fascinated by meditation at age 14. And uh, just in my intuition, I went into the basement of our family home and I started passing my attention through my body and uh, felt there was intuitively, there was some kind of freedom in connecting with raw sensation rather than always being caught up in my world of thought. At the time, I was a great thinker. I, I was hoping existence could be summed up in a particular thought and if I could just hit the right thought, it would give me this constant understanding and it would allow, somehow keep me happy all the time. This wasn't just a passing thing. When I say 17 years of exploration, I was exploring any technique I could find from any book. So once, you know, once I had tried that intuitive approach, I began searching through any book that was available, Hindu books, Christian books, Sufi books, Taoist books, Buddhist books, um, doing all kinds of wild techniques. Uh, at one point, I was trying to get into sensory deprivation. I was cutting ping pong balls in half and gluing them over my eyes. So I had this constant Gansfeld, a constant field. I was trying to reduce the stimulation that was coming in because I had this feeling that if I could just get more objective about life, I could see some subtle truth that would somehow help me live life or help me be happier than what I was. At the time, I was constantly caught up in my thoughts and my thoughts were always comparing myself to everyone else. And in those thoughts, I was always becoming uh, inadequate. Somehow I was never as good as anyone else. So again, intuitively, just with little things that were occurring in my life, I noticed that when I wasn't focused so intently on thought, when I was in connection with things like tying up my shoes or just doing something physical, there was some kind of freedom in that. So I was very much drawn to that hope of freedom. And wouldn't you know it, the very first thing when I laid down and started passing my attention through my body, uh, very shortly after I was doing that, I started doing that, um, my focus on thought fell away in a really strong way. It just fell away and all that would remained was the event of the moment expressing itself. So thought would just leave for who knows how long it really was. At the time, it seemed like a long time. And then it would come back. And in that moment, in that period where there was no thought, I just felt so free. I just thought, you know, this is it. This is what I want. It just it felt so much more real than always being focused on my world of thought. But of course, the thought always came back. And I, I was very much absorbed in thought because I had this incredible belief that thought was somehow telling me some truth about existence. Um, it seemed very useful. I mean, I could do a lot of things with thought. And because it was so useful, I had the belief that somehow it was telling me a truth about existence. So I was fascinated with thought. And in my particular case, um, I was hoping to find some absolute thought, some absolute understanding of existence through thought. So, no matter how much I experienced these open states of mind, thought would always come rushing back in to try to understand what that was. Now, I don't really give prepared talks, so we'll, I don't really know how this is going to go this evening. I have no idea, actually, what I'll be saying. Um, <laughs> I was reminded on the way here that I was supposed to be giving a talk on uh, uh, acknowledging the obvious. <laughs> and that'll, that'll probably work because in those early days um, and experiencing that openness and that freedom in those rare moments and hoping that that would somehow stay, but having thought come rushing back in an attempt to understand what was going on 
I began to get the feeling that I was touching freedom, but somehow I was losing it. That somehow I wasn't, somehow I wasn't maintaining it. I wasn't hanging on to it. And then as the years went by, you know, the 17 years went by, I became very good at sitting or lying down and not having thought. But at the end of those periods, the thought would always come rushing back because, and, and I would very naturally become very focused on that world of thought because to me it just seemed to be so important. It seemed, again, that it was telling me some truth about existence. I felt I was opening up to the big event of life. I felt that I was somehow seeing it a little more clearly. And in the process of that, I was getting a chance to see my own process, my emotions, my thoughts, the flow of my emotions, the flow of my thoughts. I was getting to see how the, my internal process was responding to certain external circumstances. And even from the very beginning, I had begun to read certain works by people like Jiddu Krishnamurti. And right from the very beginning, um, I began reading these statements about how all of existence is simply movement, that everything is changing. But no matter how many times I read that, I was hoping that actually I was going to get some place that wasn't going to change. So in these various meditation uh, experiments, I would have incredible moments of bliss, just unbelievable moments of happiness. And I was always hoping that they would somehow stay. But of course, they didn't. Um, I always wondered why they didn't, even though on a daily basis I was reading something that said everything in life is changing. So if I was reading Buddhism, that was one of the main teachings of Buddhism. Anicca, impermanence. Everything is impermanent. No matter how many times I read that, and no matter how obvious it was that everything I was trying to hang on to was always moving and shifting and changing, I, I somehow was looking for something more secret, something more subtle, something less obvious. I was looking for these rarefied states of mind. <coughs> I was looking for some particular subtle understanding of existence. Something that thought was going to tell me. Something that thought was going to reveal to me. That somehow I was going to see some minute, uh, subtle thing in the moment that was going to allow me to move into this state of freedom permanently. So it's an interesting thing that when we get into this kind of investigation of life, really in all of these teachings, you know, this teaching of impermanence isn't uh, specifically uh, aligned with Buddhism. Pretty much every philosophy I've ever run across and every spiritual teaching I've ever run across has always pointed out that everything is changing. It's one of the major statements that we make about existence. In fact, the average person on the street has probably said that, that everything is changing. Once we get to middle age, uh, we probably do have a strong sense that everything we've ever tried to hang on to has changed. We're hoping that relationships get to a certain state and remain in that state. We're wanting to get those relationships to a certain place, usually a very nice place, and we're hoping to hold them in that place. And they don't stay in that place, they change. We're hoping job situations stay a certain way. We're hoping our health stays a certain way. We're hoping that our mood stays a certain way. Again, it's always with this idea that uh, I'm hoping that something that's wonderful is going to stay and I'll be able to leave behind all of the difficult, confusing uh, situations, the difficult, confusing mind states, um, the moods that aren't so happy. And it's an interesting thing that no matter how much we try to cling to these various situations, no matter how much we try to cling to these various mind states, and they change, we always go back to trying to find something that's going to stay. We're always hoping to find something that's going to remain. So it's, 
over time, no matter how much life reveals to us that it's a moving, shifting event that never has any particular form, we're constantly trying to give it form. And there are many ways that we approach this. The Buddha basically said that there were four things that we were after. Uh, we were after constant pleasure. We were after an absolute understanding of existence. We were, ab we were after a sense of self that's always confident, never feeling lonely, never feeling anxious. And we were basically after methods and techniques that would allow us to have those first three things. And he was very clear in pointing out that Basically, you're not going to find your happiness in any of those things. So, again, it's, a, it's an odd thing that no matter how many times life presents this fact to us, that whatever we acknowledge in existence, it's changing. It doesn't matter whether it's our mood or our thoughts or our relationship situation or our job situation, it's changing. No matter how much that's obvious in our life, we don't really have a tendency to acknowledge that so much. We're, we're kind of hoping that we're going to find something that isn't going to shift on us, something that's wonderful, something that will keep us feeling happy all the time, uh, something that will keep us feeling secure all the time. And no matter how much we want that, no matter how much we might experience happy moments, no matter how much we might experience happy periods within our relationships, within our job situations, in any area of life, um, no matter how many times that shifts on us, no matter how much we're wanting to hold it in place and it shifts on us, it takes a long time, it seems, to finally acknowledge that we're not dealing with anything that's going to come to any place in particular. We're dealing with an unformed event. So again, you know, the most common comment on life that I've ever heard really over the years from everyone is that everything in existence is changing. So it doesn't really matter whether you're an astrophysicist or you're a baker in the shop on the corner. At some point, um, Almost everyone has made this comment that everything in life is changing. Now, if that's true, if that's really our sense of existence, then that must mean that all of existence is simply an unformed event. It has to be a movement. It's not a bunch of things. It's not a bunch of things that we can identify. It's not anything that we can cling to. It's an event. We aren't a particular thing that we can identify. We, you know, our particular moods, our particular ideas are not something, they're not a thing that we can attach to and hold in place. Because everything is actually a movement of some kind. It's a dynamic of some kind, a pulsing, vibrating, moving, shifting event. If we were lying on a hillside watching a cloud and we watched the cloud appear as though it, was, it looked like a person uh, and then a moment later it looked like a house and a moment later it looked like a horse, never for one moment would we think there's an actual form there because in watching the cloud we see that it's changing all of the time. If somebody asked you what a cloud looked like, you wouldn't say it looked like a horse, even though you might have seen a cloud appearing to be a horse at some time. You wouldn't say it looked like a house. You wouldn't say it looked like any particular form. You would say that a cloud doesn't have any form, that there's no form that actually exists there. And how do you know that? Simply by watching the event of the cloud. It's somewhat odd in our life that we continuously almost inevitably want to come back to the world of thought, which is describing form. We're hoping to find some kind of peace, some kind of satisfaction, some kind of freedom in the world of thought, which is constantly describing form. So I'm assuming that since this center has a Buddhist connection, you all relate 
to the phrase that everything in existence is impermanent, that everything is changing. And you probably feel that to a great degree. But if I asked you, what's this moment all about? If you were to tell me, you know, so we have the feeling that something's happening in this moment. What is it? Are you going to tell me it's a bunch of people sitting in a room? Because that's a focus on form, and you've just told me that you have the sense that life is unformed. In fact, if you ask the Buddha what is, the Buddha declared outright, there is unform, a sankata. So he referred to himself as the Tathagata. So Tathagata literally means one who is to thusness come or one who is to thusness gone. So to simplify that, it basically means one who has come to what actually is. So he declared that one who has come to what actually is basically realizes that there is only unform. What is? He declared it, unform, a sankata. And one who is, and one who has come to what actually is, no longer attempts to assess life in terms of physical form, feelings, perceptions, mental activities, or states of consciousness. Descriptions don't apply. Now, that sounds like a really subtle and esoteric teaching. But it's not. It's simply acknowledging the obvious. The Buddha acknowledges the obvious. Everything is changing. That's, that was his experience of existence. So when somebody asked him what exists, he said, unform. Whatever this is, it has no particular form. You're not going to be able to say that it's a person, a place, a thing of any kind. So he said, one who has come to what actually is no longer assesses existence in terms of physical forms, feelings, perceptions, mental activities, or states of consciousness. If you study those five classifications to any great depth, you'll realize that basically that covers every description of existence that we can possibly offer. And he stated it more simply, descriptions don't apply. And yet, for some reason, we have the experience that everything is changing. So that must mean that we have the experience that our existence is a totally unformed flowing event. Because if everything is changing, it must mean that it's only an unformed flowing event. And yet, if I ask you what life is about, you're going to give me a really complex story about a particular form that's got a particular name, it's got a particular history, and in that history there are a million other forms that have connected with your particular form. Uh, you're going to identify all kinds of things. You're going to identify the moment as a bunch of things. So why is that? It's a very obvious thing, a very obvious fact that that's what we do. We say everything in existence is changing, it ha existence has no particular form, but then if we want to contemplate the essence of existence, if we, we feel we're going to come to some deep understanding of existence, and what do we do? We focus on the world of thought. So, it's important to understand what thought can do and what thought can't do. So first and foremost, if you really do have the experience that all of existence, everything, that everything in existence is changing, do you believe that giving a very complex description of form is giving you a deep understanding of existence? Often people, when they sit in meditation, they find themselves totally focused on the world of thought. And even if they learn to leave it for a certain amount of time, to let that focus go, inevitably the focus comes back in a very strong way because we believe the thoughts are telling us some truth about existence. 
we can see they're very helpful because we can use them to bake a cake, we can use them to build a bridge, we can use them to tell jokes, we can um, do all kinds of things with thought, and that gives us the impression that they are somehow an absolute truth. And yet if we just look at the obvious, that in our life, again, if we, by the time we hit middle age, and for many it's a lot earlier than that, we do get the impression that everything in existence is changing because we, initially we have the feeling that we have some kind of control over existence, that we're going to be able to hold it still, that we're going to be able to mold ourselves in some particular way and hold that still. And we try it and it doesn't work. Everything we're trying to hold on to shifts in some way. It may shift in a slow way, it may shift very, uh, very quickly, but it all shifts. And we, we begin to see this in a very clear way. So it becomes very obvious that life is a moving, shifting, dancing event. Is there going to be a particular state of mind that you reach in meditation that's going to keep you happy all the time? I've never found one. I've never found anybody who's found one. In your own experience, you know that any mood you've ever tried to hang on to has changed. You haven't been able to hang on to it. Are you going to find any particular view of existence that's going to keep you happy all the time, always satisfied, always giving you the feeling that you're understanding existence? I've never found a view of existence that did that. I've never met anybody who found a view of existence that did that. Are you going to find some sense of self, whether you think you're a big self or no self or little self, it doesn't really matter. Are you going to find a sense of self that's always going to feel confident and never confused and never anxious? I've never found that. I've never found anybody else who's found that. The Buddha asked a certain number of his followers um, those questions saying, you know, you're looking for your happiness in all of these things, but your entire experience of all of these things is that they're moving and shifting and changing. So if that's your entire experience of all of these things that you've tried to hang on to, why are you continuing to try to find your happiness there? It's acknowledging the obvious. We're not dealing with a bunch of things that we're going to manipulate. We're not dealing with a bunch of things that we're going to hang on to whether it's a particular healthy body, a particular relationship situation, a particular thought, a particular mood. We're not going to hang on to those because they're not things. They're movement. They're a dynamic process of some kind. They're an activity, a functioning of some kind. What is it? Who knows? It doesn't have a form that you can possibly describe. If I was to ask you what existence is all about, and you told me, well, it's, a, it's about a bunch of people, a bunch of meditators sitting in a meditation hall in Boston area, in Cambridge area, um, obviously that's not true because this isn't going to exist uh, in a little while. Everyone's going to disperse. These particular forms that might be described as what existence is, they're going to disappear at some point. The Buddha pointed out that the earth itself is going to disappear at some point. So he made the comment that life is like a river that's flowing, never pausing for a moment or an instant or a second. Now that's the fact of our existence. It's obvious. In fact, we go around complaining about it all the time. Oh, the economy isn't what it used to be. My body isn't what it used to be. My relationship isn't what it used to be. The summers aren't what they used to be. The climate isn't what it used to be. The government isn't what it used to be. <laughs> That's probably the best one. It's interesting being your closest neighbor. <laughs> it's a fascinating uh, situation. A little scary <laughs> at times. So we acknowledge this all the time. We complain about it all the time. Why do we complain about it? Because we want it to stay the way it was. It used to be good, but it shifted. 
Why did it shift? What have we done wrong? What did I do wrong? I should have handled this situation better. I, we should have done a better job of who we elected as president. <laughs> why did it shift? Why did it shift? It's very obvious why it shifted. Everything changes. In this refusal of this moving, shifting, dancing event, we're basically wanting to remove 50% of what's being presented. We're wanting to remove 50% of what existence actually is because it goes up and it goes down. We want the up, we don't want the down. We want the golden glowing moments. Only those moments where we're clear and we feel secure and we feel happy and we want it to stay that way. But it has no form. It's the unform, the asankata. And in our efforts to hold it in place, a lot of the time we make physical efforts to hold things in place. But more than anything else, we want to hold it in place mentally. We want to find some concrete description of existence that's somehow going to help us understand what this is. But that's like taking a snapshot of smoke and then showing the snapshot to somebody and saying, this is what smoke looks like. But smoke doesn't look like that. In the snapshot, it has a form. But the smoke doesn't have a form. Smoke is a movement. It's an activity. It's a moving, shifting, dancing event. It has no particular form. Again, thought can do amazing things. You know, we can, uh, oh, let's see, let's, so along with this notion, along with the sense, the feeling that everything is a moving, shifting, dancing event, but then our urge to kind of hold it in place, and this urge to define it as something in particular, to, to look out and look for certain patterns and give those patterns certain names, and hoping that that's going to give us some ultimate understanding of existence. And in this situation, seeing that actually that's a bit ridiculous because if we're going around feeling that everything in existence is changing, then to try to find a description that boxes this movement up into one particular description of form, the attempt to describe forms and maintain that view of existence, that actually is a bit ridiculous. Along with that, in relation to thought, we also all have the story that when we were an infant, when we were one hour old, we didn't have a story for anything. You know, if you brought a baby in here and the baby was one hour old and you place the baby here and I turn to the baby and I say, what's this all about? What's it all about? Alfie? <laughs> Uh, what would the baby say? Nothing. The baby can't even hear a question. So this is the situation for all of us. We were all that infant, one hour old. We didn't have a story. Now we've got a bunch of stories. We've got a bunch of names and we have stories about forms interrelating in certain ways. It's simple enough from acknowledging the obvious that Actually, the stories about form are a bit ridiculous because we know that it doesn't matter how solid a form seems to be, given a certain amount of time, this is going to melt away. It's going to turn to dust. It's going to rust away. It may take a long time. It doesn't really matter. This house, this building that we're in, we have the impression that it's growing old. We don't see any actual major shift but we don't have the feeling that it's staying brand new from the moment it's built for a hundred years and then overnight it grows old. We have the general sense that it's growing old now in small ways. And anyone who has to maintain this building becomes very aware of that. 
becomes very aware of the glass drying out and if there's any putty used in any situation, that drying out and certain joints separating and causing cracks in the, uh, in the walls. This building is actually an event. We've all seen time-lapse photography. They take, you know, still shots of certain objects that are changing very slowly. They take enough of them spaced at a certain amount of time and then they run those still photographs very quickly and we see that this thing that seems to be solid and stable is actually movement. So the flower that's sitting there displaying itself is actually this movement that's of something growing up, opening up, closing, shrinking down, fading away, ultimately turning to dust really, becoming uh, mixed with the soil over its lifespan. So it's easy enough to see that life doesn't have a particular form. It's very obvious, but somehow we have a difficult time staying focused on that fact. We prefer the stories about form. That's more exciting. You know, if, you, if the Buddha was at a party and somebody said, oh, what's been happening with you? That's just the unform. That's not as exciting as hearing somebody describe a lifespan of agony. A person being born into a cold, alien world. A person involved with relationships that just haven't worked out. And a person that has all this difficulty in existence. It's not as dramatic. The afternoon soap operas would be really a lot less intense <laughs> if they were acknowledging the obvious. But again, along with that, we have this sense that we don't have a story when we're born. Nobody has a story when we're born. I didn't have a story for this when I was born. Or let me put this more succinctly. We have the feeling that something's happening right now. That's the feeling of basic existence. That's the only thing we're dealing with. It feels like something's happening right now, that there's an isness, an amness that's happening right now. So, for the baby, you know, now we say a baby is born into the world. But what actually happened for the baby in that birth process? Isn't it that all of a sudden it seemed like there was something that was happening? And there was no story for it. But in our common story, our shared story, we have the impression that over a number of years, people pointed to certain apparent forms and got us to bark certain sounds. Mom was, can you say nose, nose, nose? Can you say nose, nose, nose? Can you say nose, nose, nose? And the moment you say, nose, and then there's big applause. Every, all the adults are applaud, whoop, applauding in the room. Wonderful, it's a nose. Can you say ear? Can you say ear? Can you say ear? But what's happening there? Are you actually getting to know what anything actually is? Or are you just getting a sound that you bark to point to something? And what you're pointing to is something you can never understand. It's an absolute mystery. Now, it's helpful to learn these labels. Along the line, I learned there was some ephemeral form that I could label thirst. And then there's a less ephemeral form that I could learn is called a bottle of water. And if this so-called thirst arose, I could ask for a bottle of water and then, then this happened. And that felt good. So that's useful. We learn to do all kinds of things with these labels. But is this a bottle of water? You know, in an English-speaking country, this is a bottle of water. If you lived in France, is that what it's called? If you lived in Ukraine, is that what it's called? If you lived in Russia, is that what it's called? Is it called a bottle, a bottle of water? You don't get English terms. You get different terms. You get a different list of labels. The labels aren't telling us what this is. The labels are just pointing to this. 
When I was uh, when I was with Ruth Dennison, and we were coming to the final year of me being with her, I was training with her for about nine years, and I ended up living and teaching at her center in Southern California. And in the last year, she, uh, her husband Henry, who lived in West Hollywood, um, had started bringing a man named Robert Adams um, to the States. <laughs> And Robert would hold sessions in Henry's living room. And Ruth was very impressed with Robert Adams. So she was always saying, Daryl, you should go see Robert Adams. You need to meet Robert Adams. And I was saying, I don't really want to meet Robert Adams. So now, Robert Adams, I don't know if you all know of him, but um, basically everybody was saying he was one of the most enlightened beings on the planet. Um, he was somewhat reclusive. Uh, in those days, he wouldn't really teach to very large groups. If a large group started forming, he would move. He didn't want large groups gathering around him. Toward the end of his life, uh, he ended up living in Sedona, and large groups did start forming around him. But in those days, he was giving these talks in Henry Dennison's living room in uh, West Hollywood. And I was quite happy just doing my meditation practice, doing, for me, insight meditation was just having a good close look at whatever was going on. When I was 14 and uh, read Krishnamurti, he said, if you want to learn about life, just watch it flow. And I thought, well, that, that makes sense. I'll just watch life and learn from it directly. I'll just watch whatever's occurring. And so that became the main theme of my whole meditation practice. It didn't matter what technique I was using or what approach, what particular approach I was using. That was basically it. Um, that it was simply learning to look at life in a very objective manner. And I was learning all kinds of things. As I said, you know, I got to watch the flow of my emotions, the flow of my thoughts. I got to see how my internal system responded to external circumstances. So there were a lot of interesting things to learn there. I learned I could be a little calmer. I could be a little more objective. And in my views of existence, I realized there were options in how, in the, in the storylines I used. Um, but at this point, uh, in the ninth year, Ruth started saying this thing about, you, you need to go meet Robert Adams. And I, Ruth, I don't, want, I don't want to meet a guru. Like, I just want to continue with my practice. Like, I'm doing fine with that. But she insisted, you've got to go see Robert Adams. And I, I kept saying, I don't want to see Robert Adams. I don't want, I really have no interest in that. So one Sunday, she was going in to see her husband, Henry, and she said, you're coming with me and you're going to meet Robert. So I go into Hollywood. I'm in the living room before anybody else arrives. Robert Adams comes in. He's this little unassuming guy in a gray tracksuit with gray running shoes. He's carrying a little recorder. He sits down in the big armchair at the front of the room. He puts the recorder down on the table next to him. He sits and he waits as the 35 people show up. I'm sitting off to the side, um, just watching this whole thing happen. At a certain point, he presses a button on the recorder. It plays some song to God. Uh, we listen to that for about five or 10 minutes. And then he leans over, he shuts it off. He sits there for a moment. And then he starts to speak. And this is what he says. He sounds like like Marlon Brando in The Godfather. And so he starts to say, you are not the body, you are not the mind, there is only love. This is all he says, and he repeats this. You are not the body, you are not the mind, there is only love. So this is my first time in the presence of <laughs> a supposedly awakened being at, uh, they had said you could ask questions. So I was looking around the room and I was looking at everybody listening to this. I, I thought, I wonder what he means by this exactly. And I'm looking around the room and people are looking a bit puzzled. They're kind of leaning forward as though leaning forward is going to give them a better sense of what this means. So again, as I said, they, they had said you could ask questions. So I said, Robert. And he said, yes. I said, could we maybe put this a different way? And uh, he said, yes. Now I didn't, I didn't really know what he meant, but I had a kind of intuition after all my own years of kind of exploring existence. So I said, let's say a baby is being born into the world. And he said, yes. And I said, for 
every adult watching that, there is a baby being born into the world. And he said, yes. I said, but that's not happening for the baby. For the baby, there's no baby, there's no world, there's no birth, there's no death. And he said, no. And I said, there's no baby, no birth, no death, no world, because those are interpretations of something that's basically a mystery, and the baby doesn't have any interpretation of what this is. For the baby, there's just a moving, shifting, vibrant occurrence, the feeling that something's happening, but there's no story for it. And he said, yes. I said, but then over an apparent course of years, that baby will learn a whole bunch of labels. The baby will focus on ideas of form. And at the age of 15, the baby will be sitting on a park bench somewhere thinking, what am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going to? What's life all about? Am I OK? I don't seem to be OK. I don't seem to be as OK as some of the people around me. The baby is totally absorbed in these stories of a self, a life, absorbed in this description of forms. So Robert said, yes. And I said, but actually, there isn't any 15-year-old sitting on a park bench, is there? And he said, no. I said, there's no 15-year-old sitting on a park bench because these are wild, fantastic interpretations of something that has no form. It has no particular name. And he said, yes, you are not the body, you are not the mind. There is only love. So I said, OK, you're not the body and you're not the mind because these are fantastic interpretations of what's going on here. It's not really what's going on here. And he said, no. So in that moment, like I was very surprised because I, you know, I'd heard about enlightened beings. I had read certain things about enlightened beings. I never really paid any much attention to all of that. But here I was with somebody who was considered one of the most enlightened beings around at the time. Ruth said he was the most fully cooked individual she had ever run across. And he was saying something very simple. It's the same thing the Buddha was saying. What is? Unformed. There's no way to say what it is. Your thoughts aren't telling you what it is, no matter how useful the thoughts are. Even though we, we can comprehend that all of these things are changing, some of them are changing very slowly. And so they have the appearance of form. They ultimately don't really have a form because over apparent time, they will fade away and from moment to moment, we don't really have the impression they're staying exactly the same. We have the, the, a deep feeling that they're growing older even in this moment in subtle ways. Existence doesn't have a form that can ultimately be described. So as the Buddha pointed out, there is unform and one who has come to what actually is no longer assesses life in terms of physical forms, feelings, perceptions, mental activities, or states of consciousness. So then, what can thought actually do for us? It can help us bake a cake. It can help us build a bridge. It can help us tell a story, but it's a story. It can't tell us what existence is because it contradicts our very essential feeling that everything in existence is changing, our very essential acknowledgement of the obvious. What we're dealing with here is simply a moving, shifting, dancing event. What we are is a moving, shifting, dancing event. We were, we were this big in our mother's womb at one time, then we were this big, then we were outside the womb and we were this tall, then we were this tall, now we're this big. But it's not staying this way. I used to have hair. <laughs> That's impossible now. This body used to be a much more amazing example of humanity. <laughs> it's not that amazing anymore. We aren't anything in particular, but we always try to define ourselves as something in particular. 
You know, somebody told me, my mother told me to call myself Daryl. What am I? Am I Daryl? I don't know what I am. My mother told me to call this a body. What is it? I don't know what it is. Somebody told, my mother told me to call it a body. Okay, I can call it a body. Do I really know what it is? No, I don't know what it is. The physicists gathered together, I think it was in 1938 in Copenhagen, they came up with something called the Copenhagen Interpretation. And during that session, during that assembly, they asked the question, are, are any of our descriptions of existence a truth? And the general, uh, they had a general agreement that no, they're not truths. They're theories. They can never be truths. They're ways of approaching life that are helpful. They're useful in our daily functioning, but they can't tell us what anything actually is. So often people have difficulty in their exploration of existence because they keep feeling that thought is going to reveal something incredible to them. We don't acknowledge that thought itself is a passing event. It's never an absolute truth that's being described. We try to hang on to particular thoughts because we think they seem to make so much sense. They've got to be a truth of some kind. We even write them down in our journals, and we end up with a closet full of things that we've written down that were so important in the moment. You know, I had this realization, it was just last night, I was at this party and I had this realization. It was so, it was so vivid, it was so true. It has to be a major truth. I wrote it down, where's that piece of paper? <laughs> the grass is green. <laughs> I don't know, could have been the wine, could have been whatever. It seemed so much clearer last night. Or we read a particular book, and it seems to speak to certain issues that we're going through in the moment. And, and we, we're, we're thinking, I'm gonna hang on to this book for the rest of my life, and it will always give me this understanding, and I will always feel safe and have this feeling of security with this particular view of existence. And then next week, it's like, ah, I'm kinda tired of this book. I need to go find something new. I used to live in Berkeley where the original Shambhala books was. <laughs> I was talking this over with Doug today. <laughs> like, it was absolutely impossible at one point to walk past that bookstore and not get sucked in. It, I don't know, it was like some kind of vacuum system they had because I thought, I believed that thought was so important. Again, I was waiting for that one moment. I thought enlightenment is going to be the arising of some amazing insight, something really subtle, something that nobody else is seeing, and I will find it. I will, with sheer concentration, I will get so objectively calm and cool and collected and observe life in such a minute, detailed way that I will find this one thought that sums everything up, and that's going to be enlightenment. I wasn't interested in the obvious, that no matter what brilliant insight had come up in my life over the, the course of my life to that point, all of those brilliant insights had faded away. They became unimportant. The whole movement of thought is just a totally mysterious event. Why do we think it's something called thought? Somebody told us to call it thought. Early on, when we get into this kind of exploration, we have the feeling we're going to come to something defined. We're going to arrive at some point, and we're going to stay there, and it's going to be wonderful. We're going to have a constant understanding, a constant sense of calm, a constant sense of pleasure. And all the way along, life is showing us that that's not the case because whatever sense of pleasure we have in any particular moment leaves. It moves on to something else. It starts feeling unpleasant for a while and then it may feel pleasant again at some point in the future. Again, that's the obvious. We don't really want the obvious. We want something esoteric because it's more exciting. I don't know 
I have an urge to move this in a different direction, but I'm not sure that that's a wise thing to do. Um, but what the heck, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, yeah, I think I'll do it anyway. Um, throughout the whole course of our life journey, our apparent life journey, we basically make a couple of, of assumptions that very seldom get questioned. And those two assumptions are, number one, that we can understand in some absolute way what's happening in this moment. Now, we've just been discussing whether or not that's possible. If you ask me what's happening right here in this moment, I don't know what's happening right here in this moment. I have no way of saying what's happening in this moment. I can give you all the stories I was taught to say. I can say, oh, this is a situation where Daryl is giving a talk. Daryl's a human being that has had a certain experience in meditation centers and monasteries. And he's giving a talk to a group of people who have a similar interests in exploring life, similar interests in meditation. So I was taught to say all of that, but actually I don't really know what any of this is. I was simply told to call it by these names, but I have no essential way of knowing what any of this actually is. I know it has no particular form. I can see that very easily in the course of my life just looking in the bathroom mirror. Looking in any mirror over the, over the course of my life, I it's very obvious I don't have any particular form because whatever I used to be, I'm not that now. And what I am now isn't going to be what is going to be this in 10 years, 20 years, whatever. At some point, it's going to fade away. As the Buddha pointed out, even the earth itself is going to fade away. All things are impermanent. But the other assumption that we make in this is that from our understanding, we are directing our lives. We are, we are directing the course of our life through the world. That we are causing certain things to happen and that we are influencing certain situations. Now, I'm sure all of you have experienced the fact that at certain moments in your meditation, when you're sitting there and you're making no effort at all, the process that you are doesn't stop. The process that you are continues presenting itself. So here you are, you're all happening right now. What are you doing to make yourself happen? Like you're a living process. Do you have the impression that you're making that living process occur or is it just occurring? You have a body, you have a brain. I don't really know what they are, but I was taught to call it a body, call it a brain. Do you have the impression that you created this body and this brain? From your actual experience, from your obvious experience of existence, do you have the impression that you created this body and that you created this brain? And as you're sitting here right now doing absolutely nothing and you're happening, do you actually have the feeling you're making yourself happen or are you just happening? So your body is functioning, your brain is functioning. Are you making them function or are they just happening? The heart is beating, your so-called liver is functioning, the blood is flowing. There are pulsations, vibrations, little twinge here, little twinge there, little shift here, little shift there. Are you consciously deciding to do any of that or is it just happening? When you were in the womb, were you in there with a stopwatch and a chart saying, I've got to get out of here in nine months and I've got to reach a certain size and I really have to work at that. I really have to make that happen. Were you in there doing that or was it just the fact that you were a movement of nature when you left the womb and at some point you had an urge to start crawling, do you have the impression that you were thinking it over? Should I, should I crawl? Should I not crawl? Or did you just have an urge to crawl and that urge was strong enough that it just naturally functioned? 
You had a capacity to crawl. You had a body that could crawl. Did you create the urge to crawl? Or did the urge simply arise as a movement of nature? Did you create the body that could crawl? Did you create the fact that you had the potential to crawl? Or is that all given by nature? I don't know what your experience is, but as I sit here, this process, whatever it is, is happening. I don't have the impression I'm making it happen. This is happening. Somebody told me to call it words coming out of my mouth. I don't really know what it is. And I'm not making a conscious decision for this to occur. This simply occurs. It's occurring this way. It can't really occur any other way. This is simply what happens when somebody guides me into this kind of situation and plunks me down in front of a crowd. This happens. I don't know really, ultimately, I don't really know what it is and I'm not making it happen. There's an urge for this to occur. And it's simply f somehow this assembly that I am, this assembly that I seem to be, it follows through on that urge. We have certain motivating urges in life. We have needs. We have the need to go to the toilet every day. Did you decide at some point early on that that was going to be one of your needs? Again, were you in the womb thinking, oh, I'm going to have a lot of free time ahead of me. Uh, how should I fill it? <laughs> I know. I'll go into a little room where there's a pot of water. I'll make a bit of a mess. And I'll do that, I don't know, two or three times a day in various forms. And Let's see, I think I'll make that more difficult as I get older. <laughs> that would be a wonderful way to fill my time. Of course, we didn't decide to have this need. We, we need to eat. Did we decide that we would have a need to eat? No, we didn't decide that we would have a need to eat. We have a need to eat. There's an urge to feed ourselves. There's an urge to survive in certain ways. We have certain interests. Some of you like science. Some of you like technology. Some of you like art. Some of you like family. Some of you like business. Did you decide to have those interests? Or did you discover that you have those interests? You may have a number of interests, but one may seem stronger than the others. Did you decide that you were going to have a number of interests? Did you decide that one of them was going to be stronger than others? Or did that just happen? Is that just the expression of existence? Let me say at this point, this is just for your consideration. I'm not attempting to convince anybody of anything, but we go through life with this feeling that we're directing ourselves through existence. But where is there actually evidence of that in our obvious experience of life? Where is there actually any evidence of that? Albert Einstein, when he was 17, ran across the teachings of Schopenhauer and he ran across Schopenhauer's major statement. Der Mensch kann tun, was er will, er kann aber nicht wollen, was er will. So, you can do what you want to do, but you can't create your wants. So Einstein, in reading that, in that moment of reading that, realized, oh, I'm an expression of the universe in the same way a tomato plant is an expression of the universe, in the same way a star is an expression of the universe. So again, the obvious. It's very interesting. We go into some beautiful forest somewhere, and we marvel at the expression of nature, the expression of the universe. I should point out, the meaning of universe literally is undivided turning. Uni, meaning undivided verse from the French root ver, to turn. So, undivided turning, the big moving, shifting, dancing event. But again, we go into a forest somewhere, a very beautiful forest somewhere, and we marvel at the expressions of nature, the expressions of the universe. We don't go up to the short trees and say, if you had tried a little harder, <laughs> you could have been this big tree. We don't go up to the beetles 
and say, if you'd found just the right spiritual practice, you could have been a butterfly. Why don't we do that? Because it's perfect, right? It's the only thing it can be. Everything in that for forest is the only thing it can be. We feel that everything in existence is the expression of the laws of nature, the laws of the universe. We don't have the impression that a squirrel is deciding its career as a squirrel. Gee, should I hunt for nuts today or should I not hunt for nuts today? Is that really a wise career choice? <laughs> That's absurd. Why is it absurd? Because we don't believe that the squirrel is directing its life. We don't believe that anything in existence, anything else in existence, is directing its expression. We don't believe the bears are deciding to be bears. We don't believe the stones are deciding to be stones. I get the feeling I'm going to get this hooked. It. <laughs> it's quite obvious to us that everything in existence is the movement of something big and mysterious. When I lived in the desert, you'd go out under the desert sky, and it was this amazing arrangement of light in the sky. I wasn't standing there saying, actually, it's not working. What really working for me, like Pleiades should actually be over more with the Big Dipper. That would be a more beautiful arrangement of things. No, instead, I'm gobsmacked by this amazing event of existence. So again, we have the feeling that Everything in existence is the expression of nature, the expression of the laws of the universe. Everything except one thing, us. Now, I don't know about you, but that's weird. <laughs> like, where are we existing if we're not part of the expression? Your major refuges in Buddhism, Anicca, Nada, and Dukkha, Anicca, there is only impermanence. There's no form. Whatever this is doesn't have a particular form. Anatta, there's no definable self. There's no self that exists apart from the unform. Not in our experience. What we have is the sense that something's happening in this moment. I don't really know what it is. I don't have the sense I'm making any of this happen. And I don't have the feeling that I'm existing as anything separate from this happening. There is no self apart from this happening. There is what we call the outside of me, the inside of me, but both of those are actually the happening, the big happening of this moment. If I sit here and I make no effort at all, it goes on happening. I grow unhappening. We think we're in charge of our lives, but tonight existence is going to disappear for you. It's called sleep. We call it sleep, but literally, the feeling of existing is going to disappear. And then somehow, in that disappearance, when there's no sense of self, there's no sense of making any decision, no sense of doing anything at all, no sense of a world, no sense of anything. At some point, blink, it starts again. It feels like something's happening. We don't decide it's going to stop. We don't decide it's going to start. It just happens. Even in our decision-making processes, we have certain things that we're interested in in life. We're drawn to certain things. We find ourselves in certain situations that require what we call a decision. So we don't decide to have an event that requires a decision. We just discover it feels like there's a situation that requires a decision. So we need to make a decision. How do we make the decision? We have certain interests. We have certain needs. We have certain concerns. We have certain abilities. We have a certain lack of abilities none of which we create. We have an urge to make a decision. We don't create the urge. The urge gets strong enough that we're compelled to make a decision. We don't create that compulsion. It just occurs. 
Thanks for allowing me to offer these considerations. It is only for your consideration.